This is my authentic medieval handcart. Let me just go through some of the features of this particular primitive vehicle. I say primitive, it's actually enabling me to carry about 80 uh, kilos quite easily. A little bit hard up the hill, but it's relatively straightforward and it spreads the load. The wheels, which would have been made by a specialist wheelwright, if you had the name wheelwright, you would have made wheels. Those would have been made by a specialist. The rest was probably made by the peasant himself out of bits and pieces of wood that he could find in the hedgerow. And that's really how we've decided to put it together. This is Wattle, as made famous by Wattle and Daub, familiar to people in the context of Wattle and Daub walls. This is the same stuff you'd make baskets out of. This is actually just willow woven in and out. These uprights are hazel, which would have come from a coppiced hazel, which is an industry in the medieval period and willow woven in and out just to give the sides some kind of structure to stop things falling out sideways. Nice and cheap, readily available, very quick to do as well and completely familiar to people of the medieval era. I have my water bottle here and some aspects of the hand cart are actually using what's called rawhide which is untanned leather soaked and then allowed to dry and it tightens up when it dries and becomes very very strong. It has a flexibility to it. You, you can think of it a little bit like medieval fiberglass except it's not waterproof. If it gets wet it'll all come undone again. When it's kept dry it's incredibly strong. Rawhide's a very very good material. So the wheels are hub and spoke but they're made of segments of wood. So it's not one piece and there's no tire binding them together. There's no metal rim they're not even anything like nails nailed into the outside of it. It's just literally wood. And the spokes go all the way through with wedges. The idea being that the wedges themselves get hammered in and hopefully make the spokes firmer in use. That's the theory anyway. That's a theory that was um, suggested to me by Robert Herford, who actually made this. It's very different from a much earlier period chariot wheel, which actually did have a steel rim on it and it might be that this doesn't really need one because it's going to be trundling along at one or two maybe three miles an hour at best being pushed by a person. The spokes here are made of ash, the hub is made of oak and you'll notice the wheel is attached by a piece of antler that just goes through the axle and that just slots in there fits by pressure and stops the wheel from from going out doesn't really seem to do that much at the moment the wheel stays on the axle naturally and uh, nicely it doesn't actually rub on it there's a leather washer here which is designed to protect the wheel from going that way and rubbing against the uh, antler that's conjectural we don't know whether that's necessary or not so far it doesn't seem to be necessary the wheel because of the way it's designed stays quite close to the body of the cart itself. The wheels just go all the way straight through. There's no form of lubrication. There's no grease on the wheels, so they make a fantastic sound. And it's actually relatively easy to trundle along, although it does make a lot of noise. You'll notice that a lot of the wood has been split and carved in a very simple way. It's just been smoothed out with a knife. There are very few straight lines as we would understand them now. We, we typically buy lumber and it's been sawn by big machines in a perfectly straight line. I mean, some of it warps obviously when it dries, but most of the stuff that would have been used in the medieval period, to, especially to make kind of casual pieces like this, which is a working device, would have really been bodged together. And bodging is actually a term for this kind of work would have been bodged together by the local people. You hand drill it, you hand carve it, you make it 
really with what you've got to hand. There's no specific measurements, but if you really want to know, it is about one, two, three. It's about nine feet long, and it's about six feet long here, the bed. And it's a little bit, it's probably, yeah, it's probably about three feet wide, but it's not quite symmetrical either, which is wonderful. And in the modern day, we have an obsession with symmetrical things. In the medieval period, that wasn't the case. It was just done by eye. When it gets wet, of course, the wood will swell and all the joints will hopefully tighten up. Um, I haven't actually used it in the rain yet, so I don't know, but it seems to be pretty stable so far. You wouldn't want to go fast in it, but it's not designed for that really. It's designed to spread the load to enable you to travel back from market or to market with things you're selling back from market, especially if you don't have a beast of burden. If you're the beast of burden, this enables you to carry an awful lot more than you could just carry on your back. And you've got your own personal equipment on board as well, ways of making fire, some food, spare blankets, whatever it might be. And you can carry all of that in this very, very easily. You may have noticed that if I actually let go of the handles, the whole thing goes down at an angle, which I suppose might work quite nicely. We don't really know what they would have done, but I came up with a, an idea, which is a piece of wood that just sticks in here to hold it horizontally. It's not very stable though, to be fair, so that may need some rethinking, but it keeps the load horizontal. It's a fair chance, to be honest, with certain loads, especially if they're tied on, that you just put it down. And it has occurred to me that if you just put a tarpaulin or a sheet over this, you've got yourself a little shelter to sleep under. Quite convenient, actually. You'd, you'd keep the whole thing safe. You'd be sheltered, the load would be sheltered, you'd be underneath there, warm and cosy, and you might end up sleeping underneath it, which is something I'm going to experiment with one day. We'll see. Maybe they didn't really do that unless it was an emergency. Most carters would have gone from one place to the other uh, and stayed in, a, in an inn or the equivalent, um, much like pilgrims did at the time. They probably wouldn't have camped out much, but maybe they did sometimes save some money sleep under your hand cart. The hand cart itself, I first started just using it by holding these shaped bits and pushing. I have discovered though that if you're going uphill you might end up resting the cart on your hips like this and pushing like this. So you literally you push and hold. So I think if I was going on a long journey, I would probably make a strap to go over my shoulders because it then means that what you're doing is just using your weight and the weight is resting on your shoulders. You're not actually holding any weight with your hands. I don't know what was done, but that's what I would do. And since they're exactly the same as us, they'd have come up with that solution as well. You, of course, don't have to push this necessarily. You could pull it. And because it's only got two wheels, it can turn in its own length. Let me show you. Look, it just spins around. Makes a glorious sound. And then you stand between it, much like a horse would. And then you, off you go, you pull it. Who knows which way round? These were actually mostly used. I think it's quite likely they were used both ways around. I found going up a hill is easier to do that and trudge. And I suppose you rest. You, if you're on a long journey, you swap round occasionally and rest different muscles. A bit like using a different shoulder when you're carrying a shoulder bag, for example. If you're interested in speed, I think this goes at slightly slower than ordinary walking speed. I think if you had a backpack on, you'd go slightly faster. You trudge with something like this, especially if it was heavily laden. If you've got four or five sacks of corn on here, which is much more than you can carry comfortably, but you can certainly transport it on this, you're not going to be whizzing around the countryside. You're going to be trudging with it 
But trudging is what this is for, and it's a force multiplier. It enables you to take heavy loads yourself to the market and bring them back. These, of course, would have broken, rotted, probably wouldn't have um, been looked after particularly well. Somebody would have made a new one, maybe reused the wheels or something. So there's very few of these. We see them in illustrations. They're all sorts of designs, but broadly, two wheels and something balanced in between. I think these would have been very familiar to medieval working people. So far, it's been really fun to use and it has a beautiful sound as it goes along. And there is a reference we have from slightly later period about singing carts. Nobody really knows what the singing is all about. People thought there might be bells attached or something like that. I don't think so. I think it's simply the noise of the wooden wheel on the axle itself. 